Our first speaker today studied mostly here in Frankfurt, philosophy and sociology. As a teacher and professor, he worked in the philosophy departments at Goethe University here in Frankfurt and Humboldt University in Berlin, the Institute for Social Research, I don't have to introduce that here, the Max Weber Kolleg in Erfurt and the Mahindra Humanity Center at Harvard University and the New School for Social Research in New York. Currently, um, he told me over the phone when he, sort of, uh, when he was preparing me for this talk, uh, he goes back and forth between Lucerne in Switzerland and Frankfurt. He authored four monographies, among them a critique of sovereignty that was just published in English last year. Anarchismus zur Einführung was an introduction to, you guessed it, anarchy, which is going to be important in this talk today, I suppose. Um, Juridismus, Konturen einer kritischen Theorie des Rechts in German, as of now, just to give you another glimpse of his academic work. I also found a blog online that resulted from a seminar he taught here in Frankfurt that was looking deeply into Beyoncé's visual album called Lemonade. So uh, he knows a lot about pop culture as well. In his talk today, he will explore the relation of terms like refugee or migrant to the concept of the nation state. Well, that was an earlier version of the talk, but I think the nation state uh, and the violence inherent in the concept of the nation state definitely is going to play a role. A last note maybe on our speaker is that I think where most scholars become a bit vague or evasive or cloudy, uh, exactly at the point where we should discuss agency or best practices or ask the questions what to do, uh, Daniel doesn't leave, he's still here. And I think that's what we're going to do to after his talk called Anarchy or Barbarism, Thoughts on Violence. Let me introduce to you by name now. Please welcome Daniel Loik. Uh, thank you very much um, for this very generous introduction. Also, thank you for the invitation uh, to uh, Susanne Pfeffer, uh, Pascal Jurt, and Anna Seiler. Um, it's really an amazing lineup that you have put together. Um, I'm really honored to be part of this conference uh, along with so many people who have inspired me over the years. Um, so this is really absolutely fantastic. Um, I also want to say, um, Susanne, that I think uh, that the fact that you open up the MMK for this kind of conference and for this uh, theoretical kind of uh, uh, debate is, is uh, much needed and much welcomed. So I, I think I can speak on behalf of all the Frankfurt citizens um, that we are also looking forward uh, to uh, what's coming next. Um, and yeah, as I said, I'm, I'm really happy to be part of this um, opening. Um, embarrassingly, especially after this introduction, um, my t I think my talk is not really finished. Um, so uh, what you just pointed out that um, I, I, I don't shy away from um, being concrete, I think that's not what <laughs> I can offer today. Um, I simply don't have a solution yet. Um, so um, uh, I think maybe that's something that we have to come up with collectively. Um, I'm gonna, my, my talk is going to have three parts. Um, so um, as you might have guessed from the title, it is inspired by Rosa Luxemburg. I wanted to talk about Rosa Luxemburg. Uh, 2019 is the 100th anniversary um, uh, of her death. Uh, in uh, 1919, she was murdered by the German military. Um, and uh, maybe it's also interesting that uh, the text I'm going to talk about today um, on the crisis of social democracy was written while she was imprisoned for her um, anti-war activities uh, and especially for a speech she gave uh, here in Frankfurt in Bockenheim. Uh, not many people know that. And so I thought I wanted to take up this anniversary uh, of Rosa Luxemburg's death and talk a, bit, a little bit about the actuality or inactuality of her question uh, or of the of the um, things that um, she thought about. And then the second part, so this is the first, but the second part is 
uh, an attempt to reactualize or update her question, uh, socialism or barbarism, and I'm going to talk about uh, the refugee, so-called refugee crisis, or maybe uh, better, the, the border crisis. Uh, and um, the third part um, presents some of the challenges to um, to this question or of the, to this general um, way of thinking posed by a number of Afro-pessimist thinkers. Um, and my idea was to I would, that I would bring all of this together to a great, fantastic uh, uh, proposal, but as I said, I, I didn't manage to do that. So maybe I'm just going to um, describe a constellation, a historical constellation or a theoretical constellation um, without a clear, um, a probably rather vague um, solution. Um, almost exactly uh, a century ago, in 1915, Rosa Luxemburg wrote one of her most famous essays on the crisis of social democracy while she was imprisoned in Berlin for her anti-war activities. One year later, at the height of World War I, a text known as uh, the Junius Pamphlet became the initial policy statement of a group of dissident socialists which would later call itself the Spartacus League. The manifesto leaves no doubt about the world historical significance of World War I, a military conflict unprecedented both in its scale and its technological methods. Thousands had already led their lives on the battlefields. Most governments had effectively eliminated any opposition to the war. Many national economies lay in ruins, leaving entire populations suffering from famine and impoverishment. For Luxembourg, this historical moment reveals the inner truth of the bourgeois society. Violated, dishonored, wading in blood, dripping filth, she writes, there stands bourgeois society. This is how she truly is. Not all speck and span and moral with pretense of culture, philosophy, ethics, order, peace, and the rule of law, but the ravening beast, the witch's Sabbath of anarchy, a plague to culture and humanities, that it reveals itself in its true, its naked form. But instead of denouncing the world war as the culmination of a regular capitalistic logic, Luxembourg leaves no doubt about who is to blame for this catastrophe. It is only because of the gigantic failure of the German proletariat and its political organization, the Social Democratic Party, that the national bourgeoisies were able to convince their peoples to fight each other instead of resisting their capitalist oppressors. Fooled by mostly anti-Russian racism and national chauvinism, the German Social Democrats, as the biggest and most important group within the Socialist International, had accepted the so-called Burgfrieden policy, a truce between the political parties at the eve of the war, with the proletariat's party funding the war in the parliament, its unions refraining from striking, and its newspapers from criticizing the government a decision that had a devastating effect on the proletarian organizations in every other European nation. The alternative proposed by Luxembourg and her fellow Spartacists was a rigorous internationalism, promoting the insight that the workers have much more in common with the workers of other countries than with, their, than with the capitalists of their own, in order to build a mass movement across national borders, eventually leading to a world revolution. It is in this situation that Luxembourg, quoting Friedrich Engels, formulates the poignant alternative. Bourgeois society stands at the crossroads, either transition to socialism or regression into barbarism. These two possible roads are not to be understood in the sense of an abstract freedom of choice. Do you pick box one or two? Which in principle would allow for, an addition, for additional options, like a hypothetical box three. Rather, the binary opposition of the strict either-or is historically imposed. The development of capitalist society led to this historical bifurcation inevitably. This insight has three distinct premises. It is based on a specific social analysis, it addresses a particular political agent, and it invokes a certain idea of history or a certain idea of the outcome of history. According to Luxembourg's social analysis, the world war is a logical result of the coincidence of two distinct but interrelated dynamics, namely the consolidation of the nation state and the expansion of capitalism. 
the historically still relatively the historically still relatively new form of the nation state itself a functional requirement of the capitalist society is internally based on the formation of a homogenous culture usually including a shared language shared tradition and in general a shared national consciousness its clearly defined territorial borders sharply demarcate the nation form from the multi-ethnic empires that preceded it strictly regulating individual movement between the countries. Hannah Arendt, in her book on the origins of totalitarianism, noted that it was after World War I that for the first time in history, statelessness became a mass phenomenon, stripping thousands of people from all forms of political rights, effectively rendering them completely outlawed. In contrast, the capitalist economy is dependent on constant exploitation of new resources and new markets, finally resulting in a globally integrated economy encompassing the entire planet, allowing for a worldwide circulation of goods. This necessary tendency to expand finds its expression in the competitive imperialist and colonialist conquest of Africa and Asia, leading to the death, enslavement and torture of millions of people. Although these two lines, as Luxembourg says, two lines, the nation state and capitalism, both are necessary complements of a capitalistic mode of production, they contradict each other. While the inherent logic of the nation state is particularistic, the inherent logic of colonial capitalism is universalistic. While the, while the nation state tends to fortification, the, markets, the market tends to boundlessness. Historically, this contradiction appears as an antagonism, namely the military antagonism of the imperialist European states against each other. When at the beginning of the 17th century, Portugal tried to claim, claim a monopoly on maritime trade with the East Indies, the Dutch philosopher and legal scholar Hugo Grotius wrote the treatise The Freedom of the Sea, 1609. Grotius argues that no nation holds sovereignty over the sea and therefore should not be able to deny others access to it, as the physical nature of the sea's surface does not allow for a fixed or stable mastery. According to Grotius, the sea is more like air than like land, because it cannot be captured or fenced, it can only be the common property of all nations, and should therefore be open to all people for travel and trade. Three centuries later, this idea has become obsolete. For Luxembourg, the sea is the primary stage on which the dialectic, dialectic of universalism and particularism unfolds. Not only was Germany's attempt to build a battleship fleet that was large enough to compete with England, one of the main reasons for the opposing interests of the, main, of the two countries and its allies, Naval warfare also played a major part in, the in part in the cause and outcome of the war. Luxembourg recounts the ever-increasing naval budgets introduced by the German government since the beginning of the 20th century. Bismarck's doctrine that Germany is primarily a land power and has no need for a coastal defense has rapidly been replaced by the undisguised aspiration to form a world fleet, which Luxembourg calls a mailed fist shaked in the face of nobody in particular, but everybody altogether. The shift from land power to sea power and the accompanying domination of geographical surfaces formerly deemed uncontrollable thus appears as a crucial stage in the catastrophic unfolding of the dialectic of territori territorial fortification and economic expansion. Consequently, Luxembourg chose maritime metaphors to describe the political agent she addresses. On our ship, she writes, we have the most valuable treasures of mankind, and the proletariat is the ordained guardian. And while bourgeois society, shamed and dishonored by a bloody orgy, rushes headlong towards its doom, the international proletariat must and will gather up the golden treasure that in a moment of weakness and confusion in the chaos of the world war it has allowed to sink to the ground. Following the classical Marxist idea that the working class is the true driving force of history and therefore predisposed to be the revolutionary subject, 
Luxembourg believes that the liberation of the proletariat coincides with the liberation of mankind as a whole. The proletarian ship has thus a mission that is distinctly different from the one of the bourgeois naval battleships. battleships. The proletarian ship is a rescue boat, and it rescues not just, not just goods or castaways, but civilization as such. It is not quite clear, however, what kind of ship Luxembourg has in mind here. Is it, is it a dreadnought powered by a steam turbine, like the one that were used in the World War, or is it a galley? If so, who is rowing and who is navigating? Is the proletariat doing both at the same time? This vagueness epitomizes the ambiguity between activity and passivity that characterize the world historical condition of the proletariat in general. After all, people make their own history, she says, quoting Marx, but not according to their own free will. To this ambiguity corresponds the fact that in this quote, the valuable treasures of mankind are simultaneously on board and sunken. Civilization, it seems, remains in an unreal state between two equally possible outcomes. Between two and only two possible outcomes. This is the point of Luxembourg's historical philosophical premise. The proletariat's pendulum can swing both ways, but it can only swing both ways. Because capitalism structurally and necessarily produces both the universalist logic of expansion and the particularistic logic of exclusion, which then catastrophically clash in a global war, it is impossible to simply restore the status quo ante to return to normal liberal democracy. This insight renders all reformist politics futile. As long as the capitalist mode of production and the bourgeois state exist, their interplay will always reproduce the disaster. As Walter Benjamin, shortly before he fell prey to the very same forces that Rosa Luxemburg did, because he missed his rescue ship, put it in his thesis on the concept of history, the state of exception is precisely not an exception, but the rule. To bring about the actual state of exception, as Benjamin would have it, for Luxembourg means for the proletariat to manfully throw its revolutionary broad sword into the scales. Mit männlichem Entschluss das revolutionäre Kampfschwert in die Waagschale werfen, schreibt sie. And to resolve the binary opposition between barbarism and socialism in one direction. In accordance with a diagnosis that both of the catastrophic rationalities that led to the war in the last instance stem from the economic base of society, namely capitalism, Luxembourg proposes socialism, a primarily economic form, as the chiffre for universal redemption. Unfortunately, as always, when the fate of humanity lies in the hands of the German working class, this was not the road taken. What would it mean to repeat Luxembourg's gesture today? Certainly, we are in the middle of our own kind of world war. It is a war that is undeclared, has no clear front lines, shifting alliances, and heterogeneous temporalities. The whole world has become subject to different forms of normalized and constant violent interventions by the state and non-state actors. In June 2018, the British newspaper The Guardian published The List, a document compiled by the Dutch NGO United for Intercultural Action, listing the 34,361 names of people who died attempting to reach the European Union since 1993 due to the restrictive border policies of the fortress Europe. Many of them drowned in the Mediterranean, but death also occur in state custody, such as detention centers, asylum units, prisons, and camps, as a result of suicide or at the hand of others. Since the list only includes reported cases, the actual number is likely to be far higher. These numbers also do not yet include the death of refugees and migrants who became victims of racist mobs or of police brutality, <coughs> like Alaya Alama Kondé or Uri Jallo murdered by the German police to name but the two most prominent German cases. In addition, as a result of the transfer of the European border into Africa, more and more people are already dying 
either on road in the desert or in the detention camps based in the African countries, such as the 26 EU-funded detention centers in Libya. These deaths are accompanied and enabled by a racist public discourse fueled both by the yellow press in Germany by newspapers like the Bild Zeitung and the highbrow press as emblematically expressed in the cover page of the flagship journal of German liberalism, Die Zeit, in July 2018, openly asking the question if it is better to let asylum seekers drown. And again, these deaths are either openly supported or at least not resisted against by the German and most other national working classes who once more decided to fight the workers from other countries rather than their own oppressors. Like a century ago, the sea is one of the central battlefields of this world war, a site of the constant legal renegotiation of questions of international law, sovereignty, citizenship, and commerce, as well as a prime operational area for new techniques of fortifications and surveillance. Using uh, the theoretical framework provided for by Giorgio Agamben, who 20 years ago was widely accused of obscene exaggeration, we can today identify the political and legal rationality of the Mediterranean as one of the camp. The EU border protection agency Frontex acts as a temporary sovereign on the high seas beyond the 12 mile limit and refugees are powerless in the face of their actions. Frontex regularly engages in pushbacks that infringe international law, seeking to block refugees' rights to claim asylum in the EU member states. The Operation Mare Nostrum, which enabled many people to be rescued at sea, ended in 2014 uh, when he was replaced by Triton, a Frontex mission whose main concern is to secure the external borders of the EU. In 2018 alone, the militarization of the EU external borders has cost 2,300 lives in the Mediterranean. This year, in 2019, this is in January and February, already 221. In May 2015, the EU Council of Ministers responded to the increase of migration by deciding to confront so-called people traffickers in the Mediterranean with a military response, which involved the armed closure of one of the most important refugee roads to Europe, employing warships, submarines, drones, helicopters, satellites, and communication centers. At the instigation of the Italian government, especially its interior minister, Matteo Salvini, but willingly supported by other European countries such as Hungary and Austria, but also Germany, Europe has attempted to criminalize private sea rescues organized by grassroots initiatives and carried out by chartered rescue vessels such as the Aquarius, the Sea Watch, or the Lifeline, confiscating ships and threatening activists with long-term prison sentences. The last step of this quickly escalating dehumanization of refugees from sea rescue as a state mission in 2014 to its rigorous prohibition and hindrance in 2018 seems to be the current instances, current reported instances of so-called commercial refoulement, i.e. involuntary returns of refugees who have been picked up by, uh, on the Mediterranean by merchant ships, commercial ships, during which refugees have been told they were, be, go, uh, they were going to be brought to Europe, but instead were brought to Libyan det detention centers, possibly by instruction of private companies. As Agamben says, the camp is the space in which everybody can act as a sovereign towards the homo saka, the bare life that can be killed without committing homicide. According to Luxembourg's social analysis, World War I was the result of a coincidence of two catastrophic rationalities, that of capitalist expansion and that of the consolidation of the nation state. We can interpret the current border crisis as, as the result of the concurrence of the same two rationalities. Capitalist expansion, both in the form of militarily pursued imperialism as well as in the form of neo-colonial economic expansion, have destroyed the living conditions for millions of people. The extraction and often contamination of natural resources by global corporations the separation of indigenous population from the means of subsistence through dispossession and displacement, the destabilization and often overthrowing of local political institutions driven by the geopolitical interests of a few superpowers, 
and the dramatic man-made ecological disasters are among the reasons that force masses of people all around the globe to move one, from one place to another. This global migration and correspondingly the mass phenomenon of statelessness presents a challenge to the model of the European nation state which rests upon the fiction that birth in the territory of a state guarantees a person's citizenship of that state. The rising numbers of stateless persons can no longer be represented within the conventional nexus of birth and nationality. As predicted by Agamben, European states are less and less capable of upholding the principle of territoriality as the foundation of modern sovereignty and try to master this problem by concentrating refugees in particular areas, thereby creating spatial states of exception, such as the Mediterranean Sea, but also detention centers. If there is truth to this analysis, the border crisis as the result of the concurrence of two catastrophic rationalities, the one of capitalism and the one of the nation state, then we are confronted with the same binary alternative as a century ago. If economic globalization cannot be reversed, at least not under capitalist conditions, mass flight and migration cannot be prevented. At the same time, nation states are inherently incapable of representing this new fact within the order of their anachronistic political institutions. This renders the reformist hope of integration or inclusion futile. If the left keeps centering its attention towards the nation state, it will inevitably, inevitably reproduce the catastrophic logic of separation and exclusion of the degradation and potentially the elimination of human life. The only possibility then to overcome this barbarism we witness, we witness on the Mediterranean and elsewhere is to resolutely break with both the capitalist economy and with nation-based politics. Who is the subject that could, as Luxembourg had put it, throw its revolutionary broadsword into the scales? The reason why Marx identified the proletariat as the revolutionary subject that was that it had both a motive and the means to overcome capitalist exploitation. Its revolutionary dispositions is the result from an objective contradiction. The basis of capitalism is at the same time the basis for its overcoming or as the Communist Manifesto has, has it, capitalism necessarily produces its own grave diggers. Resisting any reformist temptation, Marx refuses the logic of integration by insisting that the task of communist politics is not to universalize the situation of the capitalist by distributing property to everybody, but instead to universalize the situation of the worker by abolishing property altogether. By demanding the negation of private property, Marx writes, the proletariat merely raises to the rank of a principle of society what society has made the principle of the proletariat, what, without its cooperation, is already, is already incorporated in it as the negative result of society. post operaist thinkers such as Tony Negri and Michael Hart have taken this motive and updated it for the 21st century. In order to exploit the worker, they argue, capitalists have always had to take care of their reproduction, cultivation and education, providing them with the knowledge and skills in needed to perform capitalist labor. This led to the emergence of a certain form of mass intelligence, which is always already cooperative and creative. Globalization of the capitalist economy combined with an increasing immaterialization of work has accelerated this process and created a worldwide commensurability of expressions and affects. This form of universality, Hart and Negri suggest, is on the one hand a capitalistic nightmare, but on the other hand the basis for collective action and in the last instance the precondition for reclaiming the means of production which nowadays are inseparably integrated into the bodies and minds of the workers. In the neoliberal conditions, this objective contradiction of exploitation and revolutionary potential reappears in an intensified form. 
On the one hand, the poor are even more at the center of social production and reproduction as neoliberal exploitation rests on precarity, mobility, and flexibility. On the other hand, they have acquired an even more creative, communicative, and effective capacities. For Hart and Negri, this paradigmatic, the paradigmatic figure of this contradiction is the migrant. Multitudes that cross over around and through national boundaries, they write in the latest book, Assembly, have the potential to undermine fixed identities and destabilize the material constitution of the global order. When migrants must be included as an active agents in global biopolitical production, when they cannot be merely subordinated as the poorest of the poor, but when their multilingual and pluricultural capacities become essential for social production, then their presence and action inevitably undermine the hierarchies of traditional identities. These subjectivities, even more mixed, are increasingly able to evade the fusional identitarian powers of control. In the inferno of poverty and in the odyssey of migration resides a new power. In a recent article for Viewpoint magazine entitled What Can a Ship Do? Beppe Kutcher and Sandro Mezzadra spell out the consequence of this analysis for solidarity work between refugees and non-refugees. The ship, again the sh motive of the ship, that rescues refugees from drowning, they insist, must be part of a larger movement that is not humanitarian, but political and thus confrontational in nature. Differing from Agamben's structural analysis, these post-operaist thinkers thus reserve a fundamental agency for migrants and refugees. Even under forced conditions, they seek their own roads, build their own connections, and form their own network. Like the proletariat, or to be more precise, as part of the proletariat, migrants and refugees already anticipate the form of the liberated society. They, too, raise to the principle of society what society has made their principle, namely living without a nation state. This idea, a world without borders and nations, then marks the uh, idea of redemption that corresponds to the post opera is update to Luxembourg's question. Rather than socialism, we might call this idea an anarchist one. It proposes new institutions of democratic self government beyond the conventional rationalities of sovereignty and national exclusion. These new anarch anarchistic institutions would no longer be bound up with the principle of territoriality and thus enable political participation of mobile people independent of locality. This implies the possibility of several political communities existing in one and the same location, as well as the possibility of belonging to several communities at once, taking account both sociality as the irreducible condition for human flourishing, as well as the ontological a-territoriality of the Zoan Politikon. One concrete perspective to start building such institutions is to establish sanctuary, refugee, or solidarity cities and open ports, thus connecting local and global struggles. To address the notion of a post-territorial citizenship from the perspective of the city makes it possible to raise the question of access to material, social, and symbolic resources on a local level without linking it to a nation-based concept of membership. In any case, if the question anarchy of barbarism expresses, it does indeed express the decisive alternative we are facing today, we need to resolutely divest our attention from national political institutions and redirect them towards the multiple emerging forms of post-national cohabitation and participation, a task that is crucial for political activists, journalists, artists, and intellectuals alike. Now to my third part. This is where it gets complicated. <laughs> to follow this imperative, <coughs> to do everything without, within our power to invent new forms of political self-government beyond the nation state, I believe 
is absolutely mandatory for us if we want to end the large-scale manifold instances of violence on the Mediterranean and elsewhere. Doing so, however, is still not enough. To authentically repeat Luxembourg's gesture, we need to do something more and maybe something different. In her pamphlet, Luxembourg quotes Marx's 18th Brumaire of Louis Bonaparte, where he talks about how Democrats usually deal with defeats. The Democrat, Marx says, comes out of the most shameful defeats as unmarked as he naively went into them. He comes away with a new, newly gained conviction that he must be victorious, not that he or his party ought to give up the old principles, but that conditions ought to accommodate him. The democratic way to deal with defeat is simply new game, new luck. The proletarian way, Luxembourg insists, must be different. Rather than simply giving it another shot at liberation, the proletariat has to be guided by, quote, self-criticism, remorseless, cruel, and going to the core of things. The next attempt to overcome the constant reproduction of barbarism, therefore, has to be based on two things. First, it has to thoroughly analyze the reason why it didn't work out the last time. And second, it has to consider the historical changes that occurred since. This is what Luxembourg calls learning, guided by no eternal doctrine and no infallible leader, but by historical experience alone. Notably, Luxembourg changes the scene from the sea to the desert, when she once more quotes Marx, who is citing the biblical Exodus story. We are truly like the Jews, she writes, that Moses led through the desert. But we are not lost and we will, not, we will be victorious if we, had not, if we have not unlearned how to learn. Rather than simply treating Luxembourg's constellation as a scheme in which each element can easily be replaced by another element, the refugee crisis instead of the world war, the multitude instead of the proletariat, anarchy instead of socialism, hoping that this time the decision will turn out differently, the constellation itself must be historicized. Attempting to apply Luxembourg's question to the contemporary situation means to betray it. Doing it justice means to learn, i.e. to acknowledge its limitation and thus its inapplicability. If we don't want to end up naive like Democrats, or even worse, social Democrats, we therefore have to dig deeper, question the social forces that produce and reproduce global barbarism more radically, which also implies investigating our own complicity with them. Generation, generations of black feminist and especially black feminist thinkers have repudiated essential premises of Marxist and most Marxist thought. By taking the economy as the prime domain of oppression and treating other forms of domination either as mere superstructure phenomena or as simple analogies to the plight of the worker, Marxist accounts often fail to properly understand the specificity and centrality of racism and sexism for our contemporary societies and therefore prove incapable of developing adequate political strategies. During the last two or three decades, Afro-pessimist thinkers such as Sadia Hartman, Jared Sexton, Hortense Spillers, and Frank Wilderson have radicalized this critique and questioned the fundamental concepts of agency, history, and utopia that fuel emancipatory social and political movements, suggesting that they often insufficiently theorize how deeply embedded anti-black racism is within the Western and therefore the global political routines. In the little time I have left, I want to at least indicate very briefly a few of the challenges they, these insights pose for the attempt to reactualize Luxembourg's question today. Following Luxembourg, we have identified the concurrence of two catastrophic rationalities as the cause for emerging barbarism, namely the expansion of capitalism and the consolidation of the nation state. But neither Luxembourg, nor Agamben, nor Hart and Negri take the racial and more specifically the anti-black structure of both of these processes really into account. While all of these approaches do mention the important role of colonialism and imperialism, they treat biopolitical exclusion as a mere structural feature, 
implying that its victims are at least in principle interchangeable. In his book, Habeas Viscus, Alexander Vehelia has pointed out the shortcomings of the current discourse on biopolitics and bare life, which fundamentally neglects how profoundly, profoundly the category of race shapes the ontological foundations of our sociality. The current global geography of the interrelated dynamics of devastation, flight, and fortification is the result of a number of specific, not just structural, but specific racialized and gendered trajectories, including the history of colonialism, genocide, slavery, and national socialism, as well as economically induced deprivation and starvation. Vehelia and others have analyzed how the European concept of the human is codependent on a differential production of the not quite human and the non-human, producing a distinct social world for black bodies that is construed as antithetical to humanity, a separation that cannot easily be, cannot easily be resolved through a shared project of liberation. This recalibration of social analysis has consequence, consequences for the question of the revolutionary subject. Despite her invocation of the proletariat's manful decisiveness, Luxembourg, without quite omitting it, already notices the impossibility of her own hope. After two years of raging war, the material conditions for revolution have been destroyed. The proletariat, as the only subject that could possibly bring about a socialist revolution, and this is the only alternative to barbarism, had already vanished. The world, today, the world war today, she writes, is demonstrably not only murder on a grand scale, it is also suicide of the working classes in Europe. While Luxembourg, speaking from a minoritarian perspective in three different ways as a Jewish-Polish woman, might already have felt that the German working class is not to be trusted. She severely underestimated German workers' libidinal investment in their country, which already in 1915 not even a decade after the German genocide of the Herero and Nama in the then Southwest Africa was heavily racialized. The fact that throughout history, not only the German working class has again and again proven to be receptive to nationalist temptations, but also that white workers in general have often found themselves incapable of, solidarities, of solidarity with workers of color, migrants or refugees cannot be dismissed as a mere coincidence. Only thorough analysis of the material, symbolic, and affective structures of whiteness and colonialism can help explain the reasons for the proletariat's recurrent corruption. Rather than helplessly appealing to a common interest, we need to acknowledge actual differences in our standpoints and social experiences, working actively to dismantle white supremacy and patriarchy instead of treating them as ephemeral differences within an overarching multitude. Decolonizing solidarity also includes questioning the hegemony of humanistic notions of agency and, and resistance, which often draw on racialized and gendered conceptions of subjectivity, as in Luxembourg's idea of manfulness. Absent a clear revolutionary subject, the idea of solidarity needs to be rethought as a transversal connection between disidentified singularities with highly situated responsibility. You already realize now it's getting vague. This then must also have an effect on the idea of the outcome of history. It must put a question mark behind utopian projects such as socialism and anarchy. In his article, Afro-Pessimism and the End of Redemption, Frank Wilderson sharply criticizes the instrumentalization of black energies for the advancement of the goals of a particular social movement. A truly radical black agenda, he claims, is terrifying to most people on the left because it emanates from a condition of suffering for which there's no imaginable strategy for redress, no narrative of redemption. According to Wilderson, black suffering and black death are not contingent effects but constitutive conditions for the differential production of humanity. Even without subscribing to Wilderson's indeed very pessimistic conclusions, his intervention calls for us to reimagine our utopian political concepts more radically than before. How can we reformulate notions like the Zoan Politikon, 
sociality, community, and human flourishing, all of which I invoked just a few minutes ago from the perspective of marginalized, excluded, and abandoned lives. <clears throat> In summary, learning from past failures and thus authentically repeating Luxembourg today could mean developing an intersectional rather than an economistic social analysis, addressing a transversal alliance of insurgent singularities rather than a predisposed revolutionary subject, and decolonize notions of liberation rather than prolonging Eurocentric models of utopia. Taken together, these three lessons then also necessitate a different idea of temporality. To imagine the current situation as a crossroads with two possible paths to take, anarchy or barbarism, is too easy because it is too optimistic. It expects the catastrophe for the future and thus fails to acknowledge the trauma and the persistence of violence that has already happened. It refuses to see that at this crossroad and along the way, history has always already reserved civilization for some and barbarism for others. Like Walter Benjamin's Angelus, we need to turn around and look back, creating a habitable world for all coincides with learning how to attend from the wounds to the wounds from our past. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Daniel, for this very vital beginning uh, of this conference. I think there um, actually was a lot of dynamite uh, in that talk to make a little uh, anarchist pun uh, right at the beginning. And uh, let me just try to ask you maybe two questions before we open that up, because we're already a little late, because the introduction was part of the first slot. Um, it's not Daniel's fault at all. But let me just begin from kind of afar, maybe, to uh, ask the first questions. Um, there has been a lot of talk of crisis and about the state of emergency regarding the borders of Europe and about you know the, the nation state as a concept is really um, at disposal, at stake um, in your talk. And yet, I think in Germany, crisis is a very ambiguous word when we talk about refugees, because there's a lot of uh, forces on the right who talk of crisis in order to produce crisis. And they talk of refugee crisis. You talk about border crisis. And yet there's two million people having come in that I would think for many of them it's a success story, actually. I wouldn't call, I wouldn't call that crisis. And I'm against that kind of work. So I think I know from up close what that also means. What exactly or how would you say, how dangerous is it to talk of crisis uh, um, in that context, or how would you sort of um, make it a little bit more precise? Would you just say it's a border crisis, but not a refugee crisis, or how would you respond to that? Yeah, I mean, this, this oh, that's very interesting. Um, and this is, uh, I think the first step is, you know, um, what, what's the problem that we identify as, mm -hmm. as a critical as a crisis? And I think the, the first step is, as you said, uh, to refuse this notion of a refugee crisis because it's not, it's not a crisis of the refugees, not caused by refugees, but it is a crisis of the nation state and, and this territorial understanding of political community. Um, and I mean, you could respond to this, to this right-wing talk of refugee crisis by saying, well, there is no crisis, there's no problem here. Um, we just, and this is, I think this is an honorable and um, probably fueled by humanistic ideas, you know, we can integrate everybody and so on. And I applaud this, but I think it's also kind of illusionary to just say um, there is no crisis at all. Because it does produce, I mean, the, the current um, uh, situation does produce a lot of suffering for a lot of people. and. Um, yeah. Uh, uh, maybe uh, Saya can talk about uh, the situation in Tijuana more, for example, where, the, where you have the caravan, and I mean, it does actually change um, the community, it does change the, um, uh, the situation in the borderlands and so on. So I think to understand that there is something critical about the situation is actually important, but then the question is how to, how to respond to that. And, and for me, the response would be fundamentally I mean, the, to, to give up this hope that we can just go back to a status quo ante and where everything is quiet and normal again, 
but to, to use this um, crisis to, for critique, right? to take it seriously, the, um, the, the, uh, the, the word crisis, which is also you know, enables critique, which, which makes it possible to fundamentally question the political institution that actually caused this crisis. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's more a question about um, the rhetorics of uh, a crisis, actually, not so much about the epistemology, I guess, but uh, with a very precise answer. Thank you for that. The second question I have before we open this up, I think, sort of uh, ties in, maybe, with what you just said, uh, or I hope. Um, you talked about integration as this sort of liberal or reformist, is a word you use pretty often, as a reformist fantasy uh, that is based on the nation state. You also cited uh, inclusion if I'm not mistaken, and there I perked up a little bit. So how is inclusion or the concept of inclusion uh, of migrants um, a liberal fantasy too? I mean, what you propose or sort of are outlining a little bit on the horizon, wouldn't that be concepts or spaces of inclusion too? When we talk about the culture of sanctuary, or we talk about new notions of university and so forth, wouldn't that include inclusion? And would that then again be based on a liberal fantasy rooted in the concept of the nation state? Well, I think we have to be careful how we understand inclusion. And I think yep. my problem with, with like a lot of the reformist um, uh, understanding is that it reproduces a container model of the, con of the nation state, right? Where you have, like, you have the nation state and it's good to be inside and it's bad to be outside. So you have, but you don't question the container as such and I think if there's something true to this analysis that nation state or that states are producing statelessness, right? Stateless, mm -hmm. Statelessness is the result of nation state. Uh, then we have to go further. We cannot just say, well, we keep the nation state, but everybody should be uh, included because then we fail to properly understand the, the catastrophic logic of the nation state as such. So we have to... Um, I think give up this idea of uh, inclusion understood as inclusion in the conventional model of membership and citizenship as we uh, understood it before. So then we have to come up with different forms of political participation beyond the nation state, which is really hard to imagine because we don't have the models for that yet, I think. Um, but that is the task I see on the horizon to, to really find a political a form that is, I mean, the nation state itself, right, emerged historically relatively late as the political representation of an already changed social situation. And now we have an already changed social situation, but we still cling to the old political institutions. And I think to find new political institutions that can actually represent the fact of migration, the fact that people are mobile and uh, are moving, um, uh, and that do not, um, and that are no longer based on this fiction of um, locality or fixed locality. I think this is really the crucial task. And then uh, this was mean a different form of inclusion too, of course. Yeah. 